Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We're following two major headlines for you this morning. One of them, the war in Ukraine, where today the fighting has intensified in the key port city of Mariupol. U.S. defense officials say Russia is now firing from ships. While all of this is happening, Ukraine's president says about 100,000 civilians are still trapped in the besieged city without food, water, or electricity. At the same time, each side is gaining some ground. Russian forces are inching closer to the center of Kyiv, but Ukraine says its counterattacks have worked to take back territory just west of the capital. All of this, though, coming at a terrible cost. Ukraine officials claim that 15,000 Russian troops have been killed in the fighting so far. This is not the war between Ukraine and Russia. This is the war between light and darkness, between goodness and uh, evil. We are determined to protect our land. Today, President Biden is set to leave for Brussels to meet with NATO leaders in a high-stakes emergency summit. The president is expected to announce new sanctions against Russia, and several sources tell NBC News the president could also announce more U.S. troop increases in NATO territory. Now to the other big story we're following this morning in Washington, where day three of the historic Supreme Court confirmation hearings is set to get underway. Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson will be back in the hot seat, vying to become the first black woman on the nation's highest court. Yesterday, Judge Jackson defended her record during the first round of questioning, which at times turned contentious. Republicans zeroed in on her background as a federal public defender and tried to paint her as soft on crime. Here are some of the highlights. I don't think that anyone can look at my record and say that it is pointing in one direction or another. You say this does not signal a heinous or egregious child pornography offense. Help me understand that. What word would you use if it's not heinous or egregious? What, what, how would you describe it? All of the offenses are egregious. But the guidelines, as you pointed out, are being departed from even with respect to the government's recommendation. I am questioning your discretion, your judgment. That's exactly what I'm doing. Do you agree with this book that is being taught with kids that, that babies are racist? Senator... <laughs> I do not believe that any child should be made to feel as though they are racist or though they are not valued or though they are less than, that they are victims, that they are oppressors. Do you agree with Justice Kavanaugh that Roe v. Wade is settled as a precedent? Roe and Casey are the settled law of the Supreme Court concerning the right to terminate a woman's pregnancy. I believe that judges are not policymakers, that um, we have a constitutional duty to decide only cases and controversies that are presented before us. We've got team coverage this morning. Civil rights attorney and former prosecutor David Henderson will join us with his analysis of the hearing so far. But first, let's go to NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale. So, Ali, let's talk about some of that contentious questioning yesterday. What was the general feeling on how Judge Jackson handled it? And can we expect to see some similar topics come up again today? Well, look, I was talking to her team, the team from the White House that's leading her through this process throughout the day yesterday, Joe. They feel like it went well. And look, she held her own over hours and hours of questioning. What you heard from Republicans was a lot of what we thought we were going to hear. Attacks around crime, attacks around judicial activism. And what the judge did was continue to blunt them. We'll get into how she did that. But I think the larger theme there, as someone who covers both this hearing, but then also the larger political 
climate on Capitol Hill is the narrative that Republicans have been trying to use nationally ahead of the midterms is that Democrats and Biden are soft on crime. This was a really micro example of that. These hearings, because really all of the senators who walked into that room as yeses on Ketanji Brown Jackson are walking out as yeses, and most of the people who walked in as noes are probably walking out as noes. What this really was was a, both sides pretty entrenched and each of them going by their own permission structures to score the points that they needed to score. For Democrats, it was largely block, blocking and tackling for the nominee. Some of them did get into some of their more pet issues, for example, dark money, antitrust issues. We did hear them run the gamut as they were talking with her yesterday. But for Republicans, there is a little bit of a different game being played here, which is that they are questioning and pressing a Democratic nominated person to the Supreme Court in the same way we watch Democrats try to score those points in the Trump era that is sort of what's happening here for Republicans. So that national narrative of soft on crime being applied here in the same way that we heard them talking about culture wars, and a lot of the other things that we see playing out on the national stage. I will say though, guys, as I was in the room yesterday, I was in there when Lindsey Graham was questioning Judge Jackson, it came at a moment where there had sort of been a lull. We had been at this for a little bit, a little while, and anyone who was maybe zoning out or looking down, their heads immediately snapped to attention when Lindsey Graham went through this line of questioning early on, asking Judge Jackson if she could rate how faithful she was on a scale of one to 10. It was just one example of one of those more tense moments in that hearing. You saw it in a lot of the clips that you played, Ted Cruz as well. And I would point out, that's really one moment where they went to Harvard together. They served on the Harvard Law Review together. Ted Cruz referenced that at the start of his questioning, and it was really the only moment that you saw Judge Jackson seem palpably frustrated throughout those hours and hours of questioning. And so, Ali, quickly, we heard a lot from Judge Jackson yesterday talking about impartiality and Republican senators pressed on some of those yeah. policy issues that resonate with the base, critical race theory, transgender rights. Quickly, how did she respond to some of those questions? Yeah, it was the same refrain over and over again, and I'll let her say it so you guys can hear it. I believe that judges are not policymakers, that um, we have a constitutional duty to decide only cases and controversies that are presented before us, and within that framework, uh, judges exercise their authority to interpret the law and not make the law. That was the refrain that we heard over and over again when Republicans and others questioned her about the way that she views the role of the courts, her role as a justice, even on some of those more key issues when we got into questions of sentencing, the refrain seemed to pretty much always be, and I'm paraphrasing, hey guys, I don't make the law, you do. Judges' jobs are just to interpret it. That was the consistent answer yesterday. All right, Ali Vitali, who spent her birthday yesterday, and I'm sure mm -hmm. no place better she would have rather spent it than during that conference. Ali, <laughs> no place so better, really. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday, Ali. Now, for more on the confirmation hearings, let's bring in David Henderson. He's a civil rights attorney and former prosecutor. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. So during these confirmation hearings, what is said is often as important as how it's said, this sort of test of temperament as well. How do you think Judge Jackson is doing so far in both those regards? I think Judge Jackson is doing a great job so far, Savannah, and I say that because it's really hard to keep your cool when she's being asked some of the questions that she's being asked. I think that the way they're questioning her takes advantage of her intelligence. I'd almost call it legal jujitsu because she's smart enough to understand what they're asking and the context in which they're asking it, but they're not making that completely clear for the public. And in that regard, I think they're taking advantage of her, asking her questions, implying things that absolutely are not true. Like, for example, that she is soft on people who severely abuse children. But I think she's handling the questions very well, given how long they questioned her yesterday. That was a beat down of a hearing, but she stayed strong to the very end. Yeah, I'll ask you about that soft on crime narrative in just a moment. But first, the topic of gay marriage came up during the hearing, specifically the Obergefell decision that legalized it nationwide. First, I want to play some of that exchange between Senator John Cornyn and Judge Jackson yesterday, and we'll talk on the other side. And isn't it apparent that when the Supreme Court decides that something that is not even in the Constitution is a fundamental right and no state can pass any law that conflicts with the Supreme Court's edict, particularly in an area where people have sincerely held religious beliefs, 
doesn't that necessarily create a conflict between what people may believe is a matter of their religious doctrine or faith and what the federal government says is the law of the land? Well, Senator, that is the nature of a right, that um, when there is a right, um, it means that there are limitations on regulation, even if uh, people are regulating pursuant to their sincerely held religious beliefs. Do you agree with marriage is not mentioned in the Constitution, is it? It is not mentioned directly, no. And um, religious freedom and um, is mentioned in the First Amendment explicitly, correct? It is. So walk us through what you see in this back and forth here, the argument here, and how this might apply to future decisions by the court. Absolutely. It's important to keep in mind how we got to this point. And Senator Cornyn began by asking about the Dred Scott decision. That was a decision where the Supreme Court said, you know what, you're a slave, you were freed, but you know what, you don't have any rights. Literally, this is the quote, black people have no rights, which white people are bound to observe. And therefore, he was determined to still be a slave. That led to Plessy v. Ferguson, where it was determined that separate but equal is lawful. Then you get this interesting pivot to a Burgerfell, whereas normally it would be to Brown v. Board of Education, the case it reversed this finding that separate but equal is lawful. And so what they're really doing is attacking the Fourth Amendment, which says no one can be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And the question becomes, what does due process mean? Are you talking about procedure or people's fundamental rights, like the right to marry the person whom they choose? And in this regard, we hear this attack over and over again. And that's part of what Senator Coyne is getting at. Quickly, I do want to go back to that point I mentioned a second ago. We just have a few seconds here. But one of the big criticisms, as you mentioned, from Republicans on Judge Jackson is that she's soft on crime. Walk us through what questions looked like on that point and how she handled them. Well, for the most part, these questions related to sentencing on cases involving child pornography. Mm -hmm. And what the judge made clear is that she actually listens to victims on these cases. She carefully considers all the information that's presented to her, and she tries to make intelligent decisions about how people should be punished in regard to these crimes. That's what judges should do. I know because I used to prosecute crimes against children. Most judges won't do it. What she demonstrated is that she does, which means that she's not only wise, but she's also a compassionate, caring person when she's on the bench. David, thank you so much for your time and analysis this morning. Let's now focus on our other top story, the war in Ukraine. This morning, Ukraine's deputy prime minister says nine civilian evacuation routes have opened with the humanitarian situation in the besieged city of Mariupol front and center. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter is in Lviv for us this morning. So, Molly, President Zelensky said about 7,000 people managed to get out of Mariupol yesterday, but 100,000 civilians still remain there. Zelensky also accused Russia of capturing a humanitarian aid convoy west of the city, what more can you tell us about that? And just how desperate is the situation there right now? Joe, good morning. That's right. That was a Zelensky, President Zelensky claim. We don't have additional uh, independent information about that convoy uh, coming out of the city. But the big picture uh, is that the worse and the more frustrated uh, the Russian troops get on the ground, the more stalled they get, uh, the more frustrated they are with their lack of progress, the worse it's going to get for civilians inside city centers. And nowhere is more dire. Nowhere is getting hammered harder than the center of Mariupol. So President Zelensky says about 100,000 people are inside. As you mentioned, 7,000 out yesterday. And we do know that there are humanitarian corridors operating today. They operate in Mariupol slightly differently. In order to get out of the city, you have to get in a private car. You have to get in a friend's, a relative's private car in a convoy. The idea is safety in numbers. To get to villages on the outskirts of Mariupol, that is where then buses as part of a greater uh, humanitarian corridor will pick people up, take them to Berdyansk, which is another strategic town uh, on the coast as well, and up to Zaporizhia. Zaporizhia, you guys, is where people can board trains to the west. But it's a really long kind of journey out, lots of checkpoints and dangerous checkpoints on that way out of Mariupol. So, Molly, this time yesterday we talked about those protests in the city of Kherson, which was captured by Russian forces. Now we're hearing from Ukrainian officials that people are starting to run out of food, run out of medical supplies. Just how concerned are they about a potential humanitarian disaster there? 
Very. So this was the first city that Russian troops occupied. As we've been discussing, the problem is, is that Russia doesn't have the troops to hold it. So it is between you guys, uh, Mariupol and Odessa. It is on that Black Sea belt that Russia wants to capture. Uh, and they have not been able to move on from Mariupol. They have not been able to put the troops that they need uh, into Mykolaiv, into Kherson to actually hold it. So what's happening in Kherson is that people are protesting almost every single day. And the way that the Russian troops there on the ground are reacting, like we saw yesterday, are attacking those crowds, are spraying those crowds with ammunition. Uh, and we do know that, according to the city officials there, they are running out of water, out of food, out of medical supplies, and now out of fuel. And, Molly, Ukraine's government says that forces have regained control of a Kyiv suburb, Makariv. The Pentagon said it was not in a position to confirm that claim. But are we seeing a change in military strategy from Ukrainians right now? Yeah, and part of it is that the Russian troops are stalled, are failing at their original objectives. But part of the story and part of the really strong narrative here is that Ukrainian troops are doing well. They have recaptured a suburb to the west of Kyiv. It's called Makariv. It is between Kyiv and Zhitomyr. It is on the strategic route west out of the capital city. Guys, according to U.K. defense officials this morning, they say this is not... Um, excuse me, they say that Russians are in a re regrouping pause before launching a bigger offensive. So maybe this is a moment, uh, this brief moment where Ukrainian troops can see some real success. But part of the narrative is that they are, you know, capturing an airport in Kherson. They are holding off Russian troops in Mykolaiv and they are capturing strategic suburbs out of the capital. The Pentagon saying troops going more on offense. Molly Hunter, thank you so much for your reporting. National security expert Jason Beardsley joins us now for more on this situation in Ukraine. He is the national executive director at the Association of the U.S. Navy. Jason, good morning. Thanks for being with us. So let's start with that situation in Mariupol. Ukrainians have been, of course, intent on maintaining control of the city, even as Russian forces essentially reduce it to rubble, like we said earlier, shooting from ships now. Do you think Mariupol represents almost a symbolic location at this point for Ukrainians to defend rather than just a strategic one? Yeah, most definitely it's uh, become more of a representative. But in addition to that, this is an important city for uh, Russia to attempt to control. It uh, establishes their land bridge with Crimea. It's also a city that's been back and forth over the last eight years. So it's very significant uh, in the east for supplies and for really control of the seaport on the Black Sea. So Mariupol for the Ukrainians, though, uh, this is a place where they want to make a stand and show that they can defeat the Russian uh, sort of military military advances. They've done pretty well, but they're going to need supplies to include food and humanitarian aid in there to really uh, continue what has essentially become a siege or a starvation sort of effort by uh, Russia's military. It's very sad to see. Yeah, it really is. No food, no water, no electricity. All right, Jason, now Pentagon officials said yesterday that Russia's combat power in Ukraine uh, has dipped below 90 percent, and that essentially reflects these heavy casualties the Russian army has suffered since invading Ukraine. Ukraine. Is there a point you think the Russian military would be rendered unable to continue its invasion between those casualties, lack of fuel, lack of food themselves? And could any of that lead to a breakthrough in peace talks? Yeah, certainly uh, the way to kind of get uh, Vladimir Putin to the peace uh, talks table is to increase the sort of um, uh, oppression that the Russian military is going through. There's a lot of defections. They've had equipment problems. They have supply problems. Uh, they're a, 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 a force that has a low morale at this point, some very difficult weather conditions, and they're open to enemy hostilities the entire time. So that is all compounding. But uh, it is very difficult for a military, especially in one a case like this where Vladimir Putin is sort of throwing every measure he can at this situation mm -hmm. to actually pull back and retreat. So really, they're in a face-saving sort of a situation, which is why you see desperation, uh, the attempt to bomb the civilian cities. It makes it a very, very tough time right now for the Ukrainian forces. What they need most, because they've shown the spirit and the will, mm -hmm. is the equipment and again, the food and the humanitarian aid to break the actual will of the Russian army. I think they're close, but these things mm -hmm. can last for a long time. We've seen sieges and militaries stall out and stalemate for, for really months and sometimes years. All right, Jason Beardsley, as always, thank you so much.
World leaders are stepping in to help Ukrainian refugees fleeing the horrors of the Russian invasion. But neighboring countries say they're also feeling the pressure as the steady flow of people crossing their borders continues to grow. More than two million refugees have already made their way to Poland. That's where President Biden is expected to discuss the humanitarian crisis unfolding across Eastern Europe following that extraordinary NATO summit. But officials in Poland say cities like Warsaw are stretched thin. Housing is becoming scarce and hospitals have reached capacity. NBC News senior national correspondent Jay Gray is on the road right now between the border and Warsaw. Jay, good morning to you. Uh, what are you expecting to see when you get to Warsaw? How do you think that's going to compare with some of the cities you've been reporting from on the border? Yeah, I think it'll be a much different scenario, Joe. Good to talk to you this morning. I think we'll see uh, uh, more organization. The border towns are small and they're overrun uh, by hundreds of thousands a week trying to get from Ukraine into parts of Poland like Warsaw. So uh, we know that they've been stretched to their limits and, and that it's going to be very uh, difficult for more people to stay permanently. But they do have uh, setups where people can come and get a couple of nights rest and move on. I, I want to show you just for a second, and we can't pretend to know what these families feel as they're making this escape from war into Poland. But we can at least show you what they're seeing on this trip. And for many, when they look out the side window of a van like this one, a bus or a train, they're seeing an area that's so unfamiliar, a place that most have never been and doesn't look like home. When they see the signs along the road, they're in a language that they don't understand, they don't speak, and so that's different. And they see this road, Joe, stretching out and just continuing continually taking them further and further from a home that they may never see again. So making this trip to Warsaw for many is so difficult, not only physically, uh, but emotionally as, as they try to move into the capital city and find some help. But as, as you mentioned, help there is, is growing more difficult to find day by day because they, again, have just been pushed to the outer edges of what they can do in Warsaw. Yeah, it, it may look like your average road, but for these families, it is anything but that. You know, Jay, while I have you, you know, the Biden administration is expecting right. to unveil its plan to try and expedite the resettlement of Ukraine refugees to the U.S. as early as this week. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan had this to say about that. Yeah. He will announce further American contributions to a coordinated humanitarian response to ease the suffering of civilians inside Ukraine and to respond to the growing flow of refugees. So, Jay, do we know who is expected to qualify for this resettlement plan? Yeah, I, I think he's going to make it easier for those who have family members in Poland to bring them back into the states to stay with them. We're also talking about those that are most vulnerable in, in Poland, and specifically, the White House has said activists, journalists, and, and members of the LGBTQ community uh, to get them in and to a place where they are safe. It, it's going to be a difficult uh, road. They've, they've got to work through some things to, to clear up some of the visa requirements and things like that. But we we do expect to hear from the White House uh, maybe as early as this week an, an expedited process for those who are, are in the most danger. Jay Gray on the road to Warsaw, thanks to technology, taking, him along, taking us along with him for a few minutes. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate it. Coming up on Morning News Now, getting candid with the U.S. Secretary of Education. The reality is we're, there's a lot of fatigue and a lot of frustration over what was missed over the last two years. But I really do believe schools are places that bring people together. When we come back, my conversation with Miguel Cardona about a myriad of controversies in the classroom, including mask mandates, critical race theory, and the so-called don't say gay bill. Plus a staggering spike during the height of the pandemic. What researchers are saying about an increase in alcohol-related deaths. That and more medical headlines in our weekly checkup. Welcome back. More of our coverage on the war in Ukraine coming up, including the U.S. troops taking part in the biggest NATO military training exercise since the end of the Cold War. But first, here are some of the other stories making news this morning right now. 
At least one person is dead this morning after a tornado touched down in southern Louisiana last night. New Orleans took a direct hit from the storm, which tore through the same neighborhoods devastated by Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Officials are now surveying the damage, hoping to find survivors. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock joins us from Araby, where they are just beginning to assess the damage left behind by this storm. Sam, good morning. Joe, good morning. Right now, we're about 15 minutes south of downtown New Orleans. You mentioned Katrina in 2005. Certainly, less than seven months ago, Hurricane Ida also sweeping through this area. As you look behind me, that used to be a church. Joe, there were homes back here. Obviously, those are wiped out. Cars flipped over. Power lines mangled. So many people this morning waking up with no power. We talked to a 46-year-old man who used his body as a shield as bricks were flying to guard his wife and his son. Just one of the many survival stories we're learning about this morning. It is huge. With streets in shambles. I heard like, like a wind I've never heard before. This morning, darkness blanketing blocks as New Orleans once again staring into the face of a deadly natural disaster. There it is. You can see it. Okay, folks, get to your safe place. Our affiliate WDSU warning residents to take cover as a terrifying black funnel cloud formed over the city on live television. For more than five minutes, the twister tearing through the lower ninth ward in nearby Araby. Those who survived the ordeal just grateful. My husband was laying on top of me and my son, and I just kept thinking, just get us through this. The damage going for as far as the eye can see, with lives completely upended in just minutes. Neighbors desperately search the streets for a missing pet as search and rescue teams go door to door and car to car. Just checking on you. Checking on this community that has already endured the wrath of Katrina in 2005, Hurricane Ida last year, and now another tornado. The storm's sheer force enough to yank this home off its foundation. I'm going to say anywhere approximately 50 to 60 feet. It comes one day after nearly 30 twisters terrorized Texas, ripping the roof right off of a school where hundreds of kids hunkered for safety, claiming a life and injuring dozens. More tornadoes popping up in Alabama, Mississippi, and of course here in Louisiana, where in hard hit Araby, Tony Vitale did whatever he could to protect his family. We lay down right there. The 46-year-old has insulation hanging from a bedroom and bricks everywhere, but he says nothing was going to happen to his wife and son. I grabbed my wife and my kid, and we laid on the floor, waited for it to pass over. Just let us make it through this. That's the only thing that was going through my mind. Once that tornado passed, Tony picked himself up. He put his boots back on, went outside, got a neighbor and his son out from debris, then went to the next house, rescued another neighbor as well. Guys, as you look around me right now, it's not just the church, the homes, that sort of infrastructure, power lines as well. This is a light dangling right above me. It looks very much like a scene might be after a hurricane as well. That's how strong the powerful winds were. We know there are survey teams that are going to be out here this morning looking at the damage. We should have an update pretty soon. The governor of Louisiana is also here. I'm told that they're taking a flyover this morning. As soon as we have more information on what they see, we'll bring that to you. Back All to you guys. Right. Sam Brock, thank you so much. That's a look at what happened. Let's look ahead and get a check on your morning news now weather. Which means Bill Karen joins us now with the latest updates. Hey, Bill, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Just a nightmare scenario with a strong tornado going through a highly densely populated area at 45 miles per hour at sunset. I mean, it's just a horrible combination. And, uh, you know, the, the fact that we had live tower cameras like this one just showing that it looked like a multiple vortex tornado. You had the main tornado in the middle there, and then on the right was kind of a little another spin off the side of it. Uh, it looks to be somewhere in the range of maybe 120 to maybe 150 mile per hour winds. Uh, uh, when the sun comes up, we'll see exactly how bad it was. So let me go and show you the timeline of all of this. So we knew that this storm was coming through. We knew we had the chance for some significant tornadoes. New Orleans at about 6 p.m., the storm started to head into the area. Downtown was, was not under a tornado warning originally. At 7 o'clock, the storm that did produce the tornado was to the south of New Orleans, around Jean Lafayette. It was at 7 o'clock that the first tornado warning was issued. And again, moving at 45 miles per hour. Then at about 719, the tornado warning was officially issued for New Orleans downtown to Araby, Terrytown. 
And then five minutes later, that storm produced a tornado. So the tornado sirens were going off. The alerts were going off on people's phones five minutes before the tornado hit. So they didn't have a lot of notice, but they had enough notice to get to their safe rooms. And then the enhanced Vegeta scale, I believe this will be somewhere between an EF2 or EF3. If you have an EF0 or an EF1, typically you get some shingles, some roof damage. You get some bark that's maybe stripped from a tree, and that's the extent of it. But if you get an EF2, like it looks like we had in New Orleans, that's when you get roofs torn off off and walls blown away and trees uprooted. And as far as totals go, 26 tornado reports yesterday. It wasn't just the New Orleans area, a bunch of tornadoes in central Mississippi. Thankfully, we have no more tornado watches. We still have a couple strong storms around Panama City and Tallahassee to Albany, Georgia, Jamaica, but no tornado watches. But later on this afternoon, guys, we still have 30 million people at risk, mostly in the southeast from wind damage, isolated tornadoes, and in the Ohio Valley we will see a chance of some hail. But we will not have a tornado outbreak today like we've had the last two days. All right. That's a little bit of good news. Bill Karens, thank you so much. Now, students in grades K through 12 have gone through a lot over the past couple years between COVID restrictions, ever-changing mask mandates, debates now over critical race theory, and the newly introduced Don't Say Gay Bill in Florida. All these heavy topics are impacting students' mental health. I sat down for a one-on-one -on -one with Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona to discuss all this and more. Here's what he had to say. I think we still don't know, of course, the full impact of COVID in so many facets of life, including in the classroom. But I mean, some indications so far are not good. Several new studies show that about a third of children in the youngest grades have fallen severely behind in reading. First and second graders are needing to relearn kindergarten curriculum. Right. How concerned should we be about this? And is it possible to make that up? Well, you, you know, it, it's clear that uh, the impact of the pandemic, we're going to still see effects of it uh, for years to come. We need to make sure that we're uh, building our schools back better than they were before. You know, the American Rescue Plan, $130 billion, they're out there now. Every state has their money. How are we making sure that those students have additional hours for school or good summer programming or smaller class sizes so that they can get that attention that they need? But I also want to focus on the uh, social emotional piece too, right? Oh, yeah. Students were behind a laptop uh, for, for a year and it uh, prevented their ability to engage with one another. So as we're thinking about catching students up, we should also be thinking about how to make sure that those interpersonal skills are being developed appropriately and that they have opportunities to engage with one another. For parents who watched up close what they felt their child was or maybe wasn't learning, maybe they felt that burden on themselves to essentially act as teacher and felt they don't know if they did a good job or not. How would you reassure them about their child's education moving forward? You know, parents were like miracle works over the yeah. last two years. You know, you know, I've had conversations with parents in my visits to different states. They had to work full time. They had to help their children, especially the younger ones with school, because they needed that support. So parents have the right to ask a lot of questions mm. and to be engaged in what schools look like. We need to do a better job making sure that the parents' voice is part of how we're uh, thinking about spending uh, these funds mm -hmm. to improve schools. You've condemned the Don't Say Gay Bill, and you said schools receiving federal funding must allow federal civil rights law, including Title IX's protections against discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Given that you said that, do you believe this bill breaks the law? Where do you think we're at? I had a chance to talk to Florida students, parents, and teachers. Uh, and one parent, Jennifer, said it best. Stop using my child as a political pawn. But everyone on the call, and these are Floridians, said the intent here is to pick on and marginalize an already vulnerable group. Um, and it, it's bullying. I heard a teacher tell me, a teacher who is gay, I can't even put up a family picture in my classroom now for fear that my children will be targeted because they have two moms. That's unacceptable in the United States of America. You know, you could veil it as a parent's rights bill. If you want to give parents rights, ask parents to talk about how to spend that $7 billion that's sitting there uh, that our students need for the mental health supports. Let's get our parents engaged in that conversation in Florida. I do believe parents need more rights. I do believe parents need to have more voice. But let's not masquerade. And what we're doing is marginalizing a group that needs our support. But it's bigger than Florida. It's, there's over a dozen states that are doing something similar. And I really feel it's, it's a, my responsibility as Secretary of Education to let those students know that we're behind them, that we're going to stand behind them, their families, the teachers, um, 
to make sure that they have a good experience and that they're not being marginalized before they walk into the classroom. By doing what? What will you do about these? And as you mentioned, it's well, unrolling in potentially dozens of states. Right. So we, we're engaging with those families, lifting up their voice, using my position to, to talk about the importance of inclusion, making sure that um, we're going after states that are doing things that are pushing students aside. We do have the Office of Civil Rights, but we also have an opportunity to reach out to them publicly, um, challenge what they're doing, reach out to their uh, state leaders, uh, legislative leaders, and work with our allies across the country to make sure we're bringing attention to support students. Let's talk about critical race theory in classrooms. Critical race theory, CRT, has become this buzzword across the country. Uh, what do you think about the approach to race in the classroom and the particular lightning rod <clears throat> that this theory has become? It's my, uh, it's my opinion that these are generated to be the boogeymen mm. to create division in our schools. So to me, those are fabricated to try to detract from the conversation about how our schools are open, how we have more money to, to support our students. I want the perspectives of people that don't agree with me. That's what makes a better school, and that's what makes a better community when all people feel heard. But at the end of the day, we're going to fight for what's right for our students. And that includes, in this case, making sure that they're learning about the history of our country and that they see people that look like them in the materials that they're reading. What do you think about the extremities that, that this has gone to in some places, the total politicization of school board races even. Yeah. I mean, parents funding races like super PACs. What, what do you think when you see that in our education system right now? I think as a country, we've experienced trauma together. And you, you're not seeing, not only in board meetings are you seeing it, the reality is we're, there's a lot of fatigue and a lot of frustration over what was missed over the last two years. But I really do believe uh, schools are places that bring people together. I believe that parents should have a right to go to a board meeting and express how they feel. Civility must prevail, but mm -hmm. democracy is that. It's coming together with different ideas. Um, and I think that's such an important principle in this country that we must preserve it, even when it's under attack in some places. Let's talk just quickly about masking in classrooms. How do you feel about where we are at with the latest CDC guidance? I'm happy uh, that we're off-ramping carefully. We can't be paralyzed by the pandemic. We can't, especially because the disproportionality of impact. We have to keep our schools open. We have to make sure that we're catching our students up and giving them more opportunities. So for me, it's, it's really important. But at the same time, in the same breath, I'm going to tell you, we're not out of the woods. There are some students who are immunocompromised, but students with disabilities that maybe are very fragile that we must continue to protect. We've just talked about a lot of heavy stuff, learning loss. Yeah. Don't say gay bill, critical race theory, the pandemic. All of this has just hit all of us so hard and all indications are that students are not doing well. What are we going to do about the mental health of students after years of being apart, after years of missing life milestones? For the last two years, I was worried about COVID. For the next two years, I'm worried about complacency. Uh, we can't go back to what it was before where we weren't building our schools with enough mental health supports. We didn't have the funding. Right now, we do have more uh, funds to get this going, but it's going to require more than American Rescue Plan funds to make sure that we sustain the mental health supports that we know our students need. In that same vein, I also asked the secretary about the fact that college enrollment rates are dropping. He said they are. That's true. And he's concerned about it. He said what he wants to do is evolve high schools and do so quickly so that there's more career opportunities, more college experience exposure earlier on in that time period. So he thinks there is a solution to that? Yeah. And he actually says that for him, it's going to re be reimagining education as a whole. And I said, well, how? And, and are you really going to do that? He said, yes, I'm talking internships and high school really bringing that exposure right away. And he says he has a plan where that's what he's really going to be doing. And it's a huge focus for him right now. All right. Something to keep an eye on. Yeah, Thanks, Savannah. Exactly. Yeah. Right, good interview. Yeah, All right, it's time now for our weekly checkup. NBC News Medical Senior <laughs> Medical. We put the word medical in many times in the <laughs> intro here because you are the expert. John Torres is here with some of the health headlines you might have missed. So first up, if someone's having a heart attack, we think of chest pain, right? But there are two other symptoms, I guess, we should be keeping an eye on. Right, that's for. the most common thing people think about with a heart attack is chest pain. And it's important to understand symptoms because time is muscle, as we say. The quicker you get taken care of, the better your heart's going to be. But we're finding out two other symptoms symptoms are more important, perhaps, especially for survival, shortness of breath and fatigue. These 
people typically don't think about when it comes to heart attacks. Yeah. And what we found out, too, is those symptoms tend to be more common in women than in men. And what they found out is that people who had those symptoms ended up having less survival from their heart attacks than people who didn't have the symptoms. Oh. So, so what are doctor's orders? Well, doctor's orders are simply to understand that heart attacks are more than just chest pain. This fatigue, the shortness of breath, those are important things as well. You know your body. And what I always tell patients is, if you think something is wrong, get it checked out. I would much rather you come in and tell me, and me tell you everything's fine, we all wasted our time, than you not come in, you have a right. heart attack, and your heart's never gonna be good again. I'm a morning show anchor with asthma, so shortness of breath and fatigue is, <laughs> I can see myself asking but my you, doctor but about that But you know your body. You it's know true. what that's it's true. like. Yeah, and if it's okay. different, okay. that's when you get it yeah. checked. Okay, that's true. All right, one for you on the pandemic. Of course, it was stressful for everybody, but now we have this new study. People started drinking more than usual. I think we know that. We've talked about that quite a bit, but there's this troubling new stat that shows the rise in alcohol consumption during the first year of the pandemic. What can you tell us about this and what it means? So these alcohol-related deaths ended up spiking 25% during the pandemic, and if you look at the graph, it's pretty dramatic. It goes up March of 2020 when the pandemic started. And you can see it going up. Unfortunately, that increase was highest in those 35 to 44 year olds. And the reason behind these deaths were a couple. One were alcohol liver disease, which we know happens, but also alcohol related opioid overdose. In other words, they ended up overdosing on opioids at the same time they were taking alcohol. So what are doctor's orders? Well, doctor's orders are essentially, especially as we've been living through the pandemic, assess and reassess your own drinkings. Look at your drinking to see what's going on and if you need to cut back on that. And know the guidelines. The guidelines are right there. Two, two drinks or less a day for men, one for women. And that's not an average. That's a daily amount. So you can't say, I'm going to save those two drinks on the weekend binge. Okay. That will not do it. It's, they're talking a daily average. So just be careful. It's good to keep in mind because some people might be thinking, oh, I'm banking these for yeah, later. You cannot the do that without Do not do that. All right. So the good news is it is spring. The bad news is sometimes some critters come out during spring, including ticks, Ugh. worries, diseases like the Heartland virus. What are the ticks you should be keeping an eye out, what should be, you be most worried about? So this about? is the Lone Star Ticks, and there's a lot of ticks we know about, oh, Lyme disease and other ticks, but the Lone Star Tick in particular is the one they're worried about. And they found them, Emory University looked, and they found them in these six states you can see right there. And the problem is with Heartland virus, it is a serious virus. It's rare, but it sometimes can be deadly, and that's the big concern. So what do you do? What are doctor's orders? Well, realize that springtime is tick time. This is when the ticks mm. come out and they flourish, and so you want to be careful. So check yourself, check your whole family for ticks. Anytime you're outside, even if you're out in the yard, just come back in and check yourselves. But check your family pets, too, because yeah. they can bring ticks in the house as well. Oof. Just be careful. Yeah. And there is actually a tick encounter center you can go to, and you can just Google tick encounter center. If you get a tick, you can take a picture of it, fill out a little survey as to how long it's been and where you think you got it, and they'll tell you whether it's dangerous, oh. what you need to do. And they're, great. they're pretty easy to remove, right? I mean, yes, you have to remove them carefully, but they're easy to remove. You just have to go down to the bottom and pull them out. Don't squish the body part because that's not good. All right, <laughs> not good. You heard it there. <laughs> I, I got a tick once, and I immediately went to somewhere to have it removed for me because there you go. I was worried about it. You could do that. All right. <laughs> Dr. Right. Torres, as always, thank you so much. You good bet. to see you. Thank you. Great to have you with us. All right, coming up on Morning News Now, investigating a tragedy. After the break, new developments on that deadly plane crash in China as crews recover one of the plane's black boxes. Also, there's some of the most vulnerable victims of the war in Ukraine, the life-saving mission for children with cancer now being cared for here in America. Welcome back. Investigators in China looking into Monday's fatal plane crash say they have now recovered one of the aircraft's black boxes as they try and figure out how and why one of the world's safest planes went down. NBC News correspondent Tom Castello joins us now with a unique perspective. Look at that on the jetliner's final moments. He is in a cockpit simulator in Bethesda, Maryland. Hey, Tom, good morning. Yes, Savannah, good morning. So this is, in fact, a 737-800 simulator. That's the exact same plane that crashed in China. Chinese authorities now say that when the plane was plummeting to the ground, controllers noticed it. They radioed the, the plane. They got no response. They got no mayday. Now this morning, we may be one step closer to finding out what happened. Breaking news this morning that could help crack the mystery of that shocking fatal crash. Chinese state media reports search teams on the mountain have found one of the plane's two black boxes at the crash site. That box could hold crucial information about the central mystery. Why did one of the world's safest passenger planes, a Boeing 737-800 cruising at 29,000 feet, suddenly go into a sharp, fatal nosedive? The last seconds caught on camera, hitting the ground in 
in less than two minutes. New video this morning shows a depression in the ground, apparently caused by the plane's impact. So we're at 29,000 feet, and this is normal cruising altitude. At Dream Aero in Maryland, oh, oh. retired airline captain Mark Weiss recreated the final moments inside the cockpit. We're going down at 6,000 feet a minute now. Absolutely. Look at your airspeed. Now I'm coming back with the throttles, but look at this. We're coming down, and they came down almost straight down like that. Look at that. And it's getting faster and faster. Is this plane out of control now? Yeah, it would be. See, look. Captain Weiss fought to pull the nose up, but the plane was pushing 500 miles per hour. Can you pull out or is it too late? I've got 8,000 feet, but here's the mountains. I just hit the mountains. There's your answer. Veteran U.S. investigators say the crash raises many questions. When was the airplane last maintained? How did it fly on its previous flights? What was the experience of the flight crew? We still can't really rule out an intentional act here. And could the plane have suffered a catastrophic decompression at 29,000 feet, putting it into a fatal dive that cost 132 lives? Three years after two deadly crashes involving the 737 MAX, Boeing says it is fully cooperating with Chinese authorities on this latest tragedy involving a different plane. Think of how many seconds we had. You couldn't pull this out. You just don't have enough strength. So, Tom, we just heard that bit there, saw him try yeah. to pull up, but there was this indication that in the final seconds the plane did pull up somehow. What do experts say about that? Yeah, so there was data suggesting that at 7,500 feet or so, the plane came back up and then mm -hmm. went down again. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of experts, including Captain Weiss, are a little skeptical about that data because you saw he couldn't pull the nose up on this plane. Yeah. The G-forces would have been just horrendous to try to pull up. So a lot of people are skeptical about that data. But, you know, really, there's also a question about whether somebody might have intentionally crashed this plane. We simply don't know too many questions, and those black boxes are going to be critical. Too many questions, and, of course, a lot of families that want answers. Tom Costello, thank you so much. Yep. A knife-wielding man killed several people in southern Israel before he was killed by an armed bystander. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice mackey Freyer joins us now with more on that and the other stories making headlines across the globe this morning. Hey, Janice. Hey, good morning. Uh, three people are dead. Two are seriously wounded after a knife attack in the southern Israeli city of Beersheba. Police say that it was a terror attack motivated by nationalism. They say a man careened his car into a cyclist, then stabbed four people. Video appeared to show armed bystanders then shooting the man at the scene. He was reportedly from a nearby Bedouin town. Canada's ruling Liberal Party has reached a deal with the NDP, the New Democrats, that could keep the minority government in power until 2025. Now, this is a rare thing because minority governments there typically only last a couple of years, and a lot of people see them as politically ineffective. As a Canadian, I can say that. Um, the deal between Justin Trudeau and Jasmeet Singh does agree on things like dental care for low-income Canadians, which is seen as a good thing, and phasing out financing for fossil fuels. And finally, the royals have arrived in Jamaica. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge are continuing their tour of Central America and the Caribbean. It isn't without some controversy, though. There were protesters in the capital city of Kingston who were voicing their opposition to retaining ties to the British crown. Now, William and Kate will spend two days in Jamaica, and they're expected to tour Trenchtown, which is where reggae legend Bob Marley mm -hmm. grew up. All and right. that is a look at your morning headlines. Thank you so much, Janice. At the NATO summit in Brussels tomorrow, President Biden could announce a plan to permanently keep U.S. troops deployed to countries around Ukraine. America is already taking part in the largest NATO military training exercise since the end of the Cold War. NBC News correspondent Courtney Cuby has this exclusive report from Norway. Troops from NATO countries are descending across Europe. 
30,000 are now in a remote coastal corner of Norway, nearly 200 miles above the Arctic Circle. Today's scenario, Norway being attacked by another nation. NATO responds, invoking Article 5 of the 1949 treaty stating an attack on one of NATO's 30 members is an attack on all. The first and only time it was ever invoked was 9-11. On hand for today's exercises, troops from 27 countries. Simulated attacks coming from air, land and sea. This is Cold Response 22, a military exercise where NATO partners must work together in frigid conditions. In the continental, you know, 48 states, weather is not as extreme as here in the high north, so um, getting us that exposure is really nice because there's a lot to learn, that's for sure. Today's drills were planned months before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It's naive to think that it's not on people's minds. So. Absolutely, they're tracking it and so are we, but the exercise is completely separate. The dangers of operating in this type of harsh environment evident last week when an Osprey crashed during a training exercise, killing the four U.S. Marines on board. They know their best friends or remains are on their way back to the U.S. and their families are grieving here. The, the challenge, as always, is to stay focused on the training on the mission at hand. A mission preparing them for real-world scenarios. And as the war unfolds in Europe, the stakes feel even higher. Courtney Kuby, NBC News, Bardifus, Norway. Now, for some Ukrainian children, the best hope of surviving both the war and cancer is here in the U.S. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital says some 600 children with cancer have escaped the war in Ukraine. NBC News senior national correspondent Carrie Sanders has a look at the life-saving mission. It's estimated more than 600 children with cancer have now escaped war-torn Ukraine, four of them arriving here at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. Ukrainian children who escaped the bombs and bullets, but not what threatened their lives before Putin attacked. Two boys, two girls, as young as 18 months, as old as eight years, each with advanced cancers, with expedited help from the U.S. State Department at St. Jude's Research Children's Hospital in Memphis. A cancer diagnosis for a family is already a life-changing thing. And then a war hits. And then a war hits, exactly. And Dr. Asaya Agulnik says it was a fast-paced 72 hours. She arrived in Poland, worked with local doctors to identify child cancer patients strong enough to handle the long trip to the U.S. Nobody can promise a child or a family that they're going to survive this cancer, but what are their... What are their likelihoods now versus what they were facing? Well, for sure, if they had remained in Ukraine where they could not continue cancer-directed therapy, they would have died from their disease. So this is, at the very least, a hope for a different outcome. Doctors at St. Jude say the four who arrived here are now being monitored closely for infections, a problem made more likely in a war zone. There have been some delays in treatment as these children left their hospitals during the war to try to find a place for safety. Do you think that safety. cost them? I hope not. I hope not. As these children arrive fighting cancer, do you think that Putin has any idea what he's doing? I would bet not. St. Jude says for the four children now here, the race away from a war zone is over. Now the marathon battle against cancer resumes. Of the four children who escaped and are now here, they're with their mothers, their siblings. Only one was able to come with their father. The other three fathers required to stay behind to fight for Ukraine against Russia. All right, Carrie Sanders, thank you so much. Coming up, skateboarding legend Tony Hawk once again proving his GOAT status. He's back on the board just two weeks after breaking his leg. More on his incredible recovery next on Morning News Now. Tony Hawk is proving why to many he's the greatest skateboarder of all time. Yeah, he's just come back from a potentially life-changing injury in record time. NBC News Now anchor Tom Yamas has the story. I'm now going to skate away from this area. Tony Hawk, right where he belongs, bouncing back from a bone-crushing wipeout. Riding a skateboard exactly two weeks after breaking his leg and even returning to the half pipe where it happened. This is right where I slammed, right here. Yeah. This is where I discovered my leg was broken. On March 7th, the 53-year-old had been doing McTwists, a move he knows well when he came crashing down. My first couple of attempts doing it from the tail drop, uh, 
One, I missed the grab a little bit. The other, I didn't really pull out enough. Hawk suffering a broken femur, sharing this x-ray on Instagram and writing, I've said many times that I won't stop skating until I am physically unable. A broken leg with plenty of hardware will probably be the biggest test of that creed. My foot feels like I think it's this way and it's actually this way. Wait, so your legs twisted? Yeah. A setback physically and mentally. But just nine days later, the skateboarding legend walking on his own without crutches. Here we go. The 10 time X game gold medalist who became the first person to land a 900 skateboarding trick in 1999, yeah. reminding us why he's said to be one of the toughest in the sport the world famous Tony Hawk. He joined us at the Olympics as an NBC commentator. This guy was one of my heroes. So cool to be next to him here in Tokyo. As the sport he helped shape was brought to the world's biggest stage for the very first time. It's been a long time coming. I think that there was interest in skateboarding in the Olympics early on and the X skate industry wasn't organized enough, didn't meet all the criteria to actually qualify. And now here we are. Hawk hoping to walk across the stage when he presents at the Oscars this Sunday and says he does plan to skate at his weekend jam event in Vegas in May. But for now, I'll try this at home. He's just grateful to be back on the board. Our thanks to Tommy Amis for that report. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.